the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Decolonizing Anarchism, MPT Acharya, Anticolonialism and Anarchism, 1922-1954, by Ole Berg Lawson. Imagine this, you are a 35-year-old Indian revolutionary married to a 33-year-old Russian artist and you've just arrived in Berlin in late November 1922 after spending three years in Russia during the revolutionary years. You've already spent almost 15 years in exile from your native India wandering across Europe, the Middle East and the United States, associating with exiled Egyptian nationalists in Paris, with pan-Islamists in Constantinople, working with the European Socialists in the Second International in Stockholm in 1917, and Russian Bolsheviks in Moscow and Afghanistan. You've lived under colonial rule all your life and have had an arrest warrant hanging over your head since 1909. You've seen the horrors and futility of war. You've witnessed the rise of totalitarian rule in Russia and you've fallen out with your communist comrades in exile, where do you turn? For MPT Acharya in 1922, the answer was clear, anarchism. Among all exiled Indian revolutionaries abroad, Acharya was the only figure to take this position and to join the ranks of the anarchists. In this anarchist essay, I explore questions such as, what did Acharya do as the only Indian within the international anarchist movement? That is, how did he place anti-colonialism on the agenda among the anarchists? And what did Acharya do as the only anarchist in the Indian anti-colonial movement? Or in what ways did he bring anarchism into India's struggle for independence and into the post-colonial era? These questions are important if we want to take seriously the issue of decolonizing anarchism. In late December 1922, Acharya and a group of Indians in Berlin attended the founding meeting of the anarcho-syndicalist International Working Men's Association, the IWMA, which had August and Sauchi, Rudolf Rocker, and Alexander Shapiro as secretaries. It is uncertain who the other Indians were, but we may surmise that Acharya's old friend, Vyandanath Chattopadhyaya, also known as Chatto, was there, as he also soon associated with the likes of Alexander Berkman, Sauchi, and Rocker in Berlin. Indeed, in his memoirs, Revolution and Regression from 1952, Rocker noted that Chateau was at the heart of the Indian community in Berlin. Soon after the founding meeting, Acharya started contributing articles on India for the IWMA press service and sent articles on anarchism to left-wing organizations in India, hoping to affiliate these with the IWMA and anarchism. But these were largely dominated by communists and hostile to Acharya's anarchist views. However, as a consequence of Acharya's writings for the IWMA press service, the British government of India banned the import of IWMA literature into India in March 1923, actually mistaking this for communist propaganda by M. N. Roy, who was also in Berlin now. But this did not deter Acharya. Throughout the next few years, Acharya corresponded frequently with prominent anarchists such as Sauchi, Bergman, Tom Keel, uh, the editor of Freedom, Guy Aldrich, the editor of The Commune, and E. R. Mond, the editor of Lang Dior asking for anarchist literature he could send to India, and he wrote for anarchist publications such as the German paper Der Syndicalist, the Dutch paper The Arbeiter, the French papers La Voix de Travail and Langue d'Or, and the American paper Road to Freedom, bringing the question of Indian independence and anti-colonial struggles more broadly into anarchist debates at the time. For example, in an article in Der Syndicalist from 1930, Acharya argued that if the workers of England and Europe had a real sense of their own interests, they would refuse the production of armaments and move towards a general strike against the capitalist attacks on Asian, African and South American farmers and workers. Precisely through these means would they fight for themselves, for socialism and against war. In order to struggle against capitalism, militarism and imperialism abroad, one has to begin a struggle in one's own country against those who, in one way or another, band together with these powers. 
That is the lesson that the politically confused European workers must learn from the great struggle against European imperialism and militarism that is underway in Asia. In fact, while the IWMA had legitimate claims to internationalism, with representation across Europe, North America and South America, this did often not extend to the colonial world, or the British colonial world at least, and in that sense, Acharya stood out as a unique figure within the international anarchist movement. In 1920s Berlin, he is still associated with some of the other Indians such as his old friend Chato and Chato's brother-in-law ACN Nambia, and later Ranchodas Bhavan Lodwala. And he frequently wrote for Indian papers such as Forward, The Maratha, The People and The Bombay Chronicle, being the Berlin correspondent for the latter paper. What is interesting about his writings for these publications is that he rarely mentioned the word anarchism, but wrote about the failure of parliamentarian politics, of the dangers of Bolshevism, nationalism and fascism. He would write for these papers anarchistically, as he later said to the Russian-American anarchist Boris Yelensky. For instance, in an article from The People from 1926, Acharya argued that Socialism and the state idea cannot be harmonized. If people want socialism, they must act for a society without the state, which can only be managed in small independent communes, acting together for common benefit by production and uniformization of consumption, without, of course, separate ownerships, barter, exchange, profits and money. In 1927, at the invitation of his old friend M.A. Faruqi and with Sauchi guaranteeing his anarchist credentials, Acharya joined the International Anti-Militarist Bureau, the IAMB, and the International Anti-Militarist Commission, the IAC, an anarchist organization set up to cooperate more effectively between the IWMA and the IAMB. And he wrote frequently on issues of anti-imperialism and anti-militarism for these two organizations monthly press services. The IAMB also had ties with the League Against Imperialism, founded in 1927 by Willy Münzenberg and Acharya's old friend Chato, with the financial backing of the Comintern. Some documents suggest that Acharya was a member and worked as a typist for the League, but soon defaulted because of its ties to the Comintern. This connection did not immediately deter the IAMB secretary, Arthur Muller Laning, because, as he wrote to Acharya, the fact is that, for the first time, we really have a connection with the colonial people, and the indisputable fact is that they all join the League. We are working in the League for as long as it's possible, not because we want to work so much with the communists, but because we think we'll lose all contact with the colonial people. The more non-communist organizations join the League, the more we'll be able to form a truly non-party organization. Miller-Laning's admission, of course, underlines the fact that the anarchists and anti-militarists did not have a strong presence in the colonial world, with the exception of Acharya, but the League offered a way in. While Acharya frequently contributed to the press services of both the IAMB and the IAC, these organizations were also interested in another Indian pacifist, namely Gandhi, whose non-violence campaign in India attracted great attention. Acharya remained ambivalent about Gandhi, sometimes criticizing him for not denouncing the state completely, but also admired Gandhi for undertaking the Salt March in 1930, for instance, calling him an anarchist tactician of the first magnitude. After Gandhi died in 1948, Acharya even went so far as to state that, quote, Gandhi did not believe that any state will establish socialism, i.e. a classless society. He was right. In this matter, he was an anarchist, maybe a philosophical anarchist. By the early 1930s, life became too dangerous for Acharya in Berlin. After the Reichstag fire in late February 1933, the German anarchist Erich Mühsam was arrested and soon after sent to a concentration camp and eventually executed in July 1934. Acharya's friend Nambia was also arrested on the same day as Mühsam, imprisoned without any charges for a month, but released with the help of the British Embassy at the end of March 1933. Alerted by these events, and at the suggestion of Subhas Chandra Bose, who was then briefly in Berlin, Acharya and his wife fled for Switzerland in February 1934, staying with his wife's sister in Zurich, and he spent the next year on the run between Zurich and Paris, where he frequently saw Armand and other French anarchists. With the help of these outlaws, as he called them, he managed to raise enough money to return to India in April 1935. He settled in Bombay, which, as Gain Prakash puts it, was the place to be if you're a writer, an artist, or radical political activist. 
Atari wrote a few articles on British colonialism as well as the Spanish Civil War, but also found time to publish his memoirs, Reminiscences of a Revolutionary in the Maratha, in 1937. In the late 1930s, he gave a few talks on anarchism in Bombay and wrote for the Oriental Review, a libertarian publication edited by his friend Ludwala, as well as for Marcus Graham's paper Man, Amans Lang de Or, and Community Life, the publication of the British Lionel Circle. When the Second World War broke out in 1939, Achari was cut off from the international anarchist movement and little is known of his activities during the war. Shortly after the end of the war, Achari joined the International Institute of Sociology in Bombay, a libertarian organization set up by Ludwala. Throughout the next few years, as the institute changed its name to Libertarian Socialist Institute due to Achari's anarchist influences, Achari and Ludwala founded an anarchist library in Bombay, reprinted anarchist texts such as Rudolf Rocker's Nationalism and Culture through its publishing ring, and reached out to global anarchist circles. Upon hearing from Achari in 1946, Sauchi wrote to Rocker, I think he's the only comrade we have in India. And Rocker responded about a month later, Of course I remember Acharya. I think you're right. He's probably the only Indian comrade we have. There are a number of intellectuals who are close to our thought, but we do not know how that develops. Nationalism has flourished there, as it has everywhere in Asia, and this ghostly light must probably burn out before people become receptive to other ideas. In 1949, when the International Anarchist Movement reconvened through the Commission for International Anarchist Relations, Achari became the point of contact for India, alongside D. N. Wanchu, the son of one of his friends. In fact, in the early 1950s, the two of them tried to start a new anarchist publication in India called The Crucible, and they reached out to the likes of Sauchi and the German Council Communist Karl Korsch, the German anarchist Helmut Rüdiger, and the Japanese anarchist Taiji Yamaka, and asked them to contribute to this new publication. It is unlikely that a magazine ever materialized, as they couldn't raise the money needed, but Achari was keen to start a new anarchist publication in Asia and carried on extensive correspondence with Yamaka and Chinese anarchist Lu Bo, as well as with Australian Council Communists Jim Dawson and Harry Houghton, with a view to do this. However, the untimely death of his wife Magda in February 1951 dealt a serious blow to Achari's activities for a while, and it seems he was unable to pursue this idea any further. He was in his mid-sixties by then and had been diagnosed with tuberculosis in late 1947, which often led him bedridden for months and his last years were plagued by starvation and illness. But that did not prevent him from writing. While Achari gradually dissociated himself from Ludwala's libertarian project, which became more libertarian individualist as opposed to libertarian socialist, he now wrote for more mainstream magazines such as Times of India, Thought, Economic Weekly, Kaisai Hind, and most frequently for Hai Jan, a paper founded by Gandhi in 1933. The communist and socialist publications refused to publish his anarchist writings, he said, so he had to write for these papers and thereby reach a different audience. Many of his articles from Kaisai Hind were reprinted in anarchist publications such as Freedom, where his friend Albert Melzer often championed Acharya's course as the only Indian anarchist. In post-colonial India, independence hadn't changed much for Acharya. A new set of masters had replaced the colonial masters, but workers were still exploited and had no real freedom. Partition had only created hostility between these former united people. As he argued in an article in the Bombay-based publication The Libertarian, if, for example, the Pakistanis fight against their own state and the Indians do likewise, there can be solidarity between the former united people. Otherwise, there will be no peace in India and Pakistan, not to speak of peace between India and Pakistan. If such a union among peoples is attempted, both the states will unite against their respective peoples instead of fighting one another. That is the nature of all states, whether capitalist, communist, Hindu, Muslim, theocratic or cultural. It is this very liberation which socialists or other progressive forces must point out. In the wake of the assassination of Gandhi in 1948, Acharya accused former Gandhians such as Rajendra Prasad, the new president of India, of betraying their former pacifist principles, now that they were in power. By contrast, the Gandhians around the Hajjan group, which included Vinoba Bhava, were near anarchists, as Acharya wrote to Boisilensky, and the editor, K.G. Mashawala, was actually becoming more sympathetic to Acharya's anarchist views, but he sadly died in 1952. In the early 1950s, Acharya was still writing for international anarchist publications such as Freedom, Tia Libertad, 
Lenobel pacifist Kant Courant and Die Freie Gesellschaft, and he had frequent correspondence with Sauchi, Amand, Jelensky, Yamaka, Melzer, the Romanian anarchist Eugen Welges, the Belgian anarchist M. Day, and the Swedish anarchist Bert Aikengren. In his letters to these figures, there's also a sense of sadness, especially after his wife died. As he wrote to M. Day in 1951, I've been ill for the last three years and postponed writing a large number of friends abroad. Recently, my wife and breadwinner also died, and I feel like a baby without anyone to take care of me. I'm now 65 years old. To Yamaga, he wrote in 1951, I feel terribly alone now, as there's no one to take care of me in my illness. If I become ill, I'll die in hospital. So I'm afraid of becoming ill, since no one will attend to me. His illness caught up with him in 1953, and in May, Acharya wrote a heartbreaking letter to Jelensky. Dear Comrade Jelensky, I've been confined to bed all these five years, and especially during the last year, I've been worse off. You probably know that my Russian wife died over two years ago. She was earning, and about earning anything since 1939. I'm ill, alone, and without any money, and I find that I'll die of malnutrition very gradually. I've let out two rooms, keeping a small one for myself, but that is not enough to give me food. I must have at least $20 more a month to get enough food. Jelensky sent Acharya $15 from the Alexander Bergman Aid Fund a few months later, but in mid-March 1954, Acharya dragged himself to the Bhatia Hospital in Bombay, where he died on the 20th of March. With Acharya's death in 1954, India lost its most prominent voice for anarchism in South Asia and the British colonial world. While he never published any major works or had his own anarchist paper, his more than 200 articles from anarchist publications across the world are testimony to a tireless agitator for anarchism in India and also to an overlooked but important figure within global anarchism in the first half of the 20th century. Through his personal experiences as an Indian anti-colonial revolutionary in exile since 1908, coming up against the limits of international socialism and the failure of Bolshevism, Acharya found a home amongst the anarchists. He placed India's freedom and the colonial question on the agenda in his writings for the IWMA Press Service and numerous other anarchist publications, and he soon tied the questions of anti-colonialism and anarchism to anti-militarism in the IAMB and the IAK and in his writings on Gandhi. At the same time, he fought a tireless fight to introduce anarchism into India's independence struggle through his many writings for publications such as Forward, The Maratha, The People and The Bombay Chronicle in the 1920s and 30s, often asking tough questions about the true meanings of freedom, socialism, communism and democracy, and later on through numerous articles in Kaiser Hind and Hai Jan. And through his work for the Libertarian Socialist Institute, there was a glimmer of hope for an anarchist movement in India, but this never materialized. If we are to take seriously the task of decolonizing anarchism, it is necessary to look closer at figures like Acharya to understand how anti-colonialists approach the politics of anarchism and to see how anarchists viewed anti-colonial struggles. At the same time, to understand the process of decolonization in the colonial world, it is important to consider Acharya's articulation of anarchism in conversation with other voices for freedom, to actually understand the true meaning of freedom, freedom not just from colonial masters, but from post-colonial masters assuming the roles left vacant by former oppressors. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.